So a month or two ago when I preached, I asked a question of you. What is it about this Jesus that actually matters in your life? I asked you why in a world that has grown understandably incredulous and even cynical at times, why are we here today? Or any Sunday morning for that matter. And why would we consider what we're doing here this morning or any Sunday morning compelling enough to want to invite anyone else into it. So hopefully you've had your morning cup of coffee or two because we have some hard questions to answer. They're hard questions for a couple of reasons. First is probably the most obvious if we think about it. As Episcopalians, we're not necessarily known as the fire in the belly Christians. No one to date has stood up during one of my sermons and declared I should testify. I have never gotten an amen during a sermon. And <laughs> well, now I have, but, <laughs> but we're not the types, historically speaking, that will jump up after realizing how Jesus matters to us and run out to make his deeds known to the people. Words like proselytize and evangelize and witness, these are a little foreign to us. We're a bit reserved. So sometimes it is hard to know how to express the answers to this question in a way that feels both heartfelt but also appropriate to us. It's also just a confusing time to be a Christian in the world. In spite of our bone-deep knowledge of the scriptures that tell us that God loves us and loves the whole world, and in spite of the complete incorporation of Christianity into every aspect of our culture, I mean, the reason it's the year 2011 is because of Jesus. I mean, so it's everywhere. Christianity is here. We're a part of it. But nonetheless, we've come to wonder if somehow other religions who we share God with are somehow a threat to our faith. So there's a whole portion of the Christian family that has gotten bogged down in worrying about all of these distractions rather than just focusing on what we know to be true. God is love, but we worry. We get worried because doubt is a part of human nature. We doubt ourselves, we doubt others, and we doubt God. We probably wouldn't want to say that very often, but our behavior over the many, many years shows that we do, we doubt God. Not that we mean to, of course, but we have been given all this room to do what we feel is best. It's the curse of free will. We start thinking that instead of having been given responsibility for things, we've been given control over things. And that's a slippery slope away from remembering that God has everything under control. And when we forget that fact, battles get fought. Physical battles, spiritual and psychological battles within ourselves and within our communities. Because if we're in control, we're right, right? And being right means that we're not wrong, right? And don't we just hate being wrong? <laughs> we all hate being wrong. Our natural inclination towards wrong things is to try and fix them as quickly as possible. And that's what causes these battles. I'm going to come and fix you because I know what God wants and you don't seem to know what God wants. And that means you, neighbor of mine, or you church down the street or you country across the world we think we have to fix things and we forget the god has been god since the beginning of creation god knows what he's doing he's a clever god after all look at all the ways he has reached out to us over the generations all the prophets and angels and martyrs and mystics he sent to teach us and then he sent jesus and God reaching out to us took on a whole new meaning. So we understood finally in a whole new way. God really does love us, just as we are. God believed in us. He believed in our broken, flawed human spirits. And God believes in us still. It's part of what makes this message from Paul's letter today so beautiful. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. 
Isn't that beautiful? A spirit that knows us better than we know our own selves. When we can't pray how we ought because we just aren't quite sure what to pray for, or how to pray, or what exactly our need is, the Spirit of God goes within us and brings out of us the completeness of who we are. God doesn't ask for our perfection in that moment. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we all have sighs too deep for words, the sighs that reflect our truest longings, our truest hearts, the selves we all yearn to be in spite of our weaknesses. Because God knows we do long to be a people who live confidently and without worry. We long, don't we? We long to just settle into the understanding that if God is for us, who can be against us? Shouldn't we all just sit there right now and revel in that? Better yet, shouldn't this soul statement send us out onto the street to proselytize, even if we are rather subdued Episcopalians? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who? The love that is so vast, so great, so generous, is named God. And that love is for us, not against us. That love is for us. Can you believe how many of us spend time worrying that this love is not for us? Or worse yet, that this love is not for someone we know? Consider the folks sitting on either side of you right now. Look around at these faces. This love is for them. It is for you, too. Consider the folks you share an office with. Consider the clients you serve. Consider your boss or your employees. Consider your children. Consider the most infuriating person you know. That love is for them. All of them. That love is for them and it's for you. Same love, not different from each other. And we cannot be separated from it. You can't be separated from it. They can't be separated from it. Paul goes on and on and on today to make this point. Bulletins, pull them out, look at the list. I'm serious. <laughs> Pull out your bulletins. What is the list? What can separate us from the love of God? Tell me. Tell me, what does he say at the end of this Romans lesson today? What does he say? 745 did really well with this. Come on, 1015. <laughs> what? Hardship, distress, persecution, right? What else? Famine and nakedness and peril and the sword. What else could keep us? Death, life, angels, rulers things present and things to come, powers, height, depth. None of it, none of it can keep us from the love of God. What isn't covered there? What isn't covered? There's nothing left to try and claim could separate us from the love of God. Nothing left. Warriors, I hear your minds. I hear it. It's happening. You're thinking, there's exceptions, there's exceptions to the rule. I'm a worrier too, I get it. I know that I could be, maybe I could be just outside of what Paul is talking about, or somebody I know could be just outside what Paul's talking about. Nope, can't do it. We can't do it, there's nothing outside of it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Everything, it's all encompassing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can I get an amen? <laughs> there. And now I've asked and gotten one too. That's good. I'm happy. Good Episcopalians. I'm proud. And that brings us to the gospel for today. Spreading this love of God in Christ Jesus that nobody can be separated from, that's kingdom work. We're going to bring the kingdom. We as folks who follow Jesus want to bring the kingdom of God to fruition here on earth. That's what we're doing here. Because the kingdom is where all of this makes sense. The kingdom is where we have it all figured out, what we need, and then we've laid everything else to rest. The kingdom is where we're free from worry, worry, worry. The kingdom is where we will, for every moment, live fully in the knowledge that God is for us. So our collective goal as Christians, whether we have ever said it, whether we've ever even thought it, is this, to bring the kingdom to fruition here on earth, to help with 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So what does the scripture tell us the kingdom of heaven is like? It's like a mustard seed planted in a field. The world is the field. The kingdom of heaven has been planted here in this world, make no mistake. And now it's ours to grow the message of love into that massive tree that will provide a home for everyone. Have you ever planted a seed in hopes of it turning into a tree? It seems futile. I remember planting seeds growing up on the farm around, I'd forget all about them when I was a kid. <laughs> but after a day or two of going back to check if the tree had started growing, I'd, I'd forget. But we do better than that because the kingdom is bigger and stronger than that. The seed is growing. We're helping it grow. And the kingdom is growing in a way that we can identify now, but when this was being written, nobody expected it to be a seed that was gonna grow into a tree. They all thought that the Savior was gonna come galloping in with an army to make everything right. And, it, and that's not how it worked. It was a seed in the ground, this little tiny seed that has to grow and grow. Kingdom work takes a long time. Then the scriptures tell us that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast in bread. Mixed up all the yeast with the flour and the whole loaf of bread will be leavened. All of it will rise. The world is the flour. Jesus is the yeast. He's going to be a part of the whole proverbial loaf that is us, humanity. No part of us will go unleavened. No part of the world will go without the kingdom because we'll all grow together. And then, and then when we actually encounter the kingdom, when it becomes clear to us, even for a moment, that what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, is the kingdom, we're going to spend the rest of our lives pursuing it. Just like someone who sells everything they have to buy a field where the treasure is buried. Just like a merchant who gives up everything to buy the finest pearl. When really faced with the kingdom, we're going to let everything else fall to the wayside so that we can help the kingdom come. Lastly, and most importantly in this passage today, the kingdom of heaven is a net that caught fish of every kind. Who sorted them out? Who sorted out the fish? Angels, God's angels, sorted out the fish. It wasn't me, it wasn't you, it wasn't any human. It was God and God's angels. This is not our worry. Those worriers like me, we can just set that part aside. We don't, we don't have to worry about figuring out who's doing it right and who might be doing it wrong. It's God's business, not ours. We're going to be here to live and share with each other. Our job is simply to remember that God is for us and then let our life flow from that truth. Our job is to remember that nothing we can do Nothing that anyone can do can separate us from the love of God and then let our actions reflect that joy that comes with that love. A saint of St. Barnabas died this past week, Suzanne Propstra. Suzanne was the lovely lady who attended this service and she sat right back there with her caregiver each Sunday. She was one who needed uh, to receive communion in her pew and I always loved bringing her communion from the very first time I got to do that. Because when I would hand her the bread and say, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, she wouldn't say amen. She would say, thank you, God. And then when I would give her the wine and I would say, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, she would say, I love you, God. And it was so heartfelt. It was so sincere. And each and every time I got to give her communion, that was her heartfelt response 